excited to have Heather back with us. Um, the first time that I met Heather was actually uh, during Sea Otter Awareness Week, and she did a fantastic presentation um, on uh, sea otters and some research that they were uh, working on. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just read you her bio here so that you can kind of get to know Heather a little bit more in case you haven't had the pleasure of meeting her yet. Um, so Heather is the science communication director and research scientist for the Sea Otter Savvy program. Heather's interests in sea otter conservation and ecology developed through her undergraduate degree at UC Santa Cruz and graduate or sorry, internship through the Monterey Bay Aquarium and graduate research at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. As the science communication director, Heather refines science communication strategies, oversees creation and promotion of science related materials, leads science related media relations, and develops special projects for outreach that will support the Sea Otter Savvy mission. As a research scientist, Heather will continue her research interests in human disturbance in sea otters. And our human disturbance in sea otters uh, section is actually happening um, next Friday. Uh, so today we're just gonna cover the basics. If you wanna learn a little bit more about Heather um, and read her full bio, or if you want to learn more about the Sea Otter Savvy program, I would encourage you um, to visit their website, www.seaottersavvy.org, and you can learn all about the great work that they're doing, and I'm sure Heather's gonna focus on that uh, a fair amount today. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and give the uh, mic over to Heather. Heather, are you ready? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much, Robin. I'm really excited to be here. I'm also going to shortly just start my video so people can actually see me for a moment. <laughs> that works. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm in my apartment here in Oakland, but I'm excited to be um, virtually being able to talk to everyone today. And thank you for that excellent um, introduction. Yeah, today I, I'm thrilled to be able to talk to um, all of you to discuss a little bit more and get sort of a, a foundation about sea otter facts and versus fiction. Um, I think even though researching sea otters, there's still so much more I can always learn. And so it's also good. I kind of equate it to um, the game telephone. Sometimes you can start with something and then over time it sort of builds into its own entity. And so it's good to kind of go back to the original fact and discuss um, where it came from, some of the research behind it. So I'm going to now turn off my video. So you've all said, seen me and said hi, and then that way I can start the presentation and that way you guys can just focus on the hopefully really interesting information you guys are gonna be getting today. So I'm gonna turn that off, but hopefully everyone can still hear me. Um, so yes, I am the science communication director and research scientist with Sea Otter Savvy, and I finished my graduate degree last year with Moss Landing Marine Laboratories. Um, and so, oh, that didn't like that. Oh, not like that. Okay, that works. <laughs> I'm also still learning how to do this virtually. Um, but so I do want to give a little bit of a, a shout out and overview that yes, there are going to, this is not the only webinar series we're doing. There is going to be three that will be focused on sea otters. Um, and the reason is because there is an immense amount of information. It's almost overwhelming to figure out how to cover all of the information, um, especially if it's just in one. Um, and so I've broken it into sort of three separate webinars. So today is really just going to be basic natural history to really create that foundation. And then next week, we will focus more on understanding disturbance, sea otter physiology, some of the energetics. Um, and then at the end, we're going to have an advanced Q and answer um, question and answer webinar. And that's going to kind of go over some case studies, recent research, and it's going to delve deeper into topics um, such as range expansion, predation, toxicology. Some of those are very complex. And so we want to make sure we're giving them some time so that we can really get to the meat of it. But so for today, this again, we're just going to go over some of the classification, range, habitat, physical description, adaptations, reproduction, behavior, diet, and end with status. Um, and so hopefully we cover a wide array of topics that you guys may receive questions on. And so that way we can clarify certain facts. And so throughout all of this, there's going to be moments of fact versus fiction. And so I'm going to try my best to kind of go and find out, even though there are some 
facts that may be fictionalized out there, some of them do have a grain of truth to them. And so we're going to kind of discuss um, maybe how they evolved into that. So with any species, I do think it's really important to start with classification and some of the evolution. So the sea otter was actually first scientifically recorded and described by George Steller in 1751. And the scientific name that we have now in Hydrolutris actually went through a series of changes and it wasn't accepted as in Hydrolutris until about 1922. And so in Hydra is an ancient Greek meaning in water and uh, Lutris is otter in Latin. And so they are of the mustelid family. Those are the weasels and they are a very large sea weasel. <laughs> Um, and fossil evidence actually indicates that this anhydra lineage became isolated in the northern Pacific about 1.6 million years ago. And so that gave rise to the modern sea otter that we know today. But essentially, it started and evolved through Japan, northern Japan, through Russia, Aleutian Isles, Alaska, all the way down through that North American coastline. And today, there are three recognized subspecies. We have the anhydra lutris lutris, um, the Asian sea otter. There's the Anhydra lutris canyoni, the northern sea otter, and the Anhydra lutris nares, which is the southern sea otter. We also call the California sea otter. And so that's the particular subspecies we're going to be talking about today. And so now I just want to touch on sort of range and habitat um, and, of course, some of the history, right? So in the early 1700s, um, there basically the worldwide population was estimated from anywhere of 150,000 to 300,000 individuals. And so prior to essentially the fur trade and that large scale commercial exploitation, indigenous people did hunt sea otters and there was periodically um, local reductions of the species, but ultimately that species, sea otters remained abundant through their range until about the mid 1700s. And so it really was the arrival of Russian explorers in around 19, uh, 1741 in through Alaska, when there really was that extensive commercial harvesting of sea otters for pelts. And through the next 150 years, that resulted in near extirpation of the species. And so it wasn't until 1911 there was the fur seal treaty and they did receive some protection from that and so by that point there was approximately they expect about 2,000 animals remained and they were really in 13 remnant colonies and you can see that how it fragmented the species so if you're looking at the map the black line was the historical range and those red dots were what were the remnant colonies at that period of time in 1911. so now i want to show you guys a little bit more about current range so on that same map to the left in red is the historical range with the yellow with the current range and you can still see that they're they're not necessarily all connected but it has grown um and i've highlighted to the right just the area of the california or the southern sea otter range okay and you can see that their range extends from a little south of the point conception all the way up to about approximately pigeon point and this is a heat map of density. So what you're looking at is in the areas that are really, really red, those are going to be areas we have a lot more sea otters. There's going to be a higher density there. So you can see Elkhorn Slough, Monterey, Cambria, Cayucas, more, but those areas have high density of sea otters. Um, and then in certain areas along the coastline, there's perhaps a little bit more difficulty um, the habitat might be more difficult, maybe less prey in that area. But you can see that there's sort of a a growth that you're seeing the expansion, but that's sort of giving you the end range. And then we also have San Nicolas Island there at the bottom. Um, and we will also be talking a little bit more about San Nicolas on our third webinar, uh, but they are, sea otters were reintroduced there in about um, late eight, 1980s. And so now the current sea otter population is approximately um, 3,000 individuals, while the total sea otter population is around 125,000. So now I want to talk a little bit about home range specifically for California sea otters. So sea otters are locals. OK, so they re live relatively in shallow coastal waters. Um, they usually stay within a kilometer offshore. So they're not that doesn't mean they aren't capable of swimming out further. But generally, they're going to be site specific. They're going to be focusing on where their food is. And so they also really like areas that are more protected and to rest in areas that um, are away from some of the severe ocean winds um, and kelp, they use kelp a lot. Um, and they also can be associated with estuarine areas like Elkhorn Slough. 
And so sea otters do tend to raft and they generally are comprised of female rafts groups with a territorial male, but there's also male rafts out there. Um, and those, that's an opportunity for males to kind of get together and learn a lot from each other. But generally individuals occupy a home range that's only a few kilometers long and they remain there year round. Now, young males, surprise, surprise, <laughs> tend to be more risk takers. And so they can and tend to go out and explore further out and might be going further out from range, but generally they are locals and females specifically are very site specific. And so for example, this is an individual 7792. She has a home range that's just north of San Simeon Point. And you can see that all those little blue dots are, you know, sightings of her. And so this is her area. And so she ends up feeding mainly on medium prey and rocky bottom habitat. And she is typically in kelp and close to shore. Um, and during the study, she was not considered a very good forager, or great forager. So when they were looking at her, she was really struggling to survive because she was a young mother and she was competing with other otters for food. And so it's important to note that females are constrained by reproduction and their energetic costs. And so this is one of the reasons why they are so localized, right? You're gonna focus more on staying where the food is and it's rather than exploring new habitats. And so the reason I'm pointing out an individual as well is to help remind us all that sea otters are individuals. So although they're sort of broad reaching subjects and you know comments and facts about them, they do have different personalities, they do different things and they live locally. So they're essentially your neighbor. Um, another key habitat that generally sort of surprises people is when we talk about being on shore. And so a lot of people assume that if a sea otter is on shore, that they might be sick. And so this brings me to my first fact versus fiction. Um, are sea otters on shore sick? And so I've definitely been out there before and people come up and they see sea otters on shore and they're like, oh my God, is it dying? Is it okay? Um, and the truth is land is a critical part of their habitat and it's often overlooked. And it is true. So injured, ill, some older individuals, they will tend to seek areas that are calm and warm. Um, and so that hauling out would be a good benefit, but also healthy sea otters do benefit from hauling out as well. So as we designate more areas for wildlife and we reduce human traffic and specific coastal areas, we actually begin to see that more and more sea otters actively come ashore to rest, warm up, and at times they actually do interact. So for example, up in Moss Landing by Jetty Road, there was a little beach area. And when that was actually cordoned off so people could not access it, more and more sea otters would be seen hauling out there and interacting. So it's not just sick individuals, there are healthy individuals and young individuals. And you can also think about females. If they do have a pup and you're living in really cold water, there is a aspect of maybe wanting to get the pup out of the cold water. So females up in sloughs have been observed pulling them up and they will lay on the pickleweed. Um, you also probably heard that certain females can even put their pups on top of um, docks while they go and forage and stuff like that. And so there is, if you are living in cold water, probably a good reason for wanting to get out of it sometimes. It makes life a little bit easier. So I would say a species that is constantly trying to stay warm, it shouldn't be surprising that they would try and haul out. But it is true that for those that are ill or sick or um, older, it, it's also a really important part of their habitat. So it is something to consider when you see sea otters on shore, they're probably going up there for a reason um, that they need to warm up. So now I'm just going to touch a little bit on sea otter census. So if we're talking about range and habitat, we also need to know where they are. And so to make sure that we're actually getting accurate counts of the population, there is a California sea otter census and it happens like a, a snapshot. So basically people are, tons of people go out that first week in May and they have people on the ground, they have planes going over. And the goal is to try to as quickly as possible, have a snapshot of where every single sea otter is in California. Um, now it is, does require good weather conditions. So sometimes that first week in May has to adjust a little bit. Um, you do need the good spotting conditions. So weather is a huge factor, especially with um, flight as well. And so the final count is actually an average over three years. And this helps account for inevitable variation due to weather and sea otter movement. But really most importantly, this helps policy and the protection of the species. So because decisions are made based off of 
these numbers. So for example, the population currently has been remaining you know, around that 3000 um, number and around the delisting threshold for the Endangered Species Act. And so sea otter status is actually currently under review. So accurate reporting of the population is crucial for these decisions. But just keep note, if you guys are out there in early May and you start to see a whole bunch of sea otter biologists <laughs> counting sea otters, it's probably the census. Um, and you should come and say hi. And we can talk more about that while we're out there in the field. Um, and so now I'm finally going to get, here's the physical description slide. In almost every sort of textbook, there has to be something that what do they look like? Um, well, sea otters, they are a large weasel. They are the heaviest of the mucilids. And they do have flipper-shaped hind feet. And they actually are the only mammal with paws in the front and flippers in the back. And they have thick brown fur. And they can actually have lighter tones that kind of go through. And that's known, we like to call it grizzle. Which brings me to another fact versus fiction. So I've been asked this a lot, that um, can you age a sea otter by their grizzle? Now, so although sea otters, they are usually that very dark brown chocolatey color, some individuals do progressively sort of get lighter and colored. And you can see that on the head, the neck, they, some of them go all the way down to the chest um, and onto their forearms. And it's due to the loss of uh, pigmentation in their guard hairs. And so the extent though of this grizzle, it is related to age, but it's also related to individual genetic variation. So you can see on the left, you have an adult female that's very, very dark. In the middle, there's more of what I would call that blonde sort of um, caramelly sort of color happening. And then you can also see silver and white. And then ultimately, I like to think of Steve. He ended up going silver in his mid thirties. And so grizzle and graying can be very specific to an individual. Some people don't end up going gray for much, much later in their life. So I would say that, no, you should not be aging your sea otter by this grizzle, but it is a very interesting, um, it would be interesting to learn more about the genetic aspect of grizzle and how quickly that can, um, if there's certain individuals and, and certain aspects to that. But generally we do not age sea otters by their grizzle. So now I want to touch on the point that as a marine mammal, it is extremely difficult to survive in the marine environment and you require certain adaptations to be able to survive. Um, but sea otters in particular have a dilemma. Um, sea otters don't actually store fat as blubber like many other marine mammal species do. So you can see over there cetaceans, pinnipeds, polar bears, you know, they all have a longer evolutionary history. And so they have adapted for that, but sea otters have not. So instead of blubber for insulation, they have extremely thick fur and it can hold warm air. So in fact, they actually have up to a million hairs per square inch. And so they have the thickest fur of any mammal, but this does, this actually depends on where on the body that is. So not every single body part is gonna have a million hairs per square inch, but in certain areas that is the case. Um, but you can see that there's other areas that maybe have less per square inch. Some of them lack hair completely like their paws, their nose around the eyes. Um, and so these areas are where heat can easily be lost. And so you can see that sea otters, when they're resting, they keep their paws out of the water because if that hits the cold water, they're gonna lose heat. Sometimes you'll see them resting and they'll have um, their paws over their eyes to help keep warm. And then with the, they actually have two different types of hair. So it, you have the interlocking under fur. And so that, that interlocking portion, you can see I've highlighted they almost have these little barbs. And so as they're blowing air and grooming themselves, those kind of connect and allow this sort of warm air bubble to come around them. And that's what's providing the insulation. And then the longer guard hairs that they have actually help water run off the coat. So this kind of combined system ends up trapping air next to their skin, right? Because the last thing you want is to have cold ocean water hitting your skin. So when fur is well groomed, their skin does not come in contact with the water. And that's why grooming is so important. And it's why you see them grooming and fidgeting all the time. They're constantly trying to shift. Sometimes you can even see them shake. So probably moving some of that air through their fur to make sure that their, their skin is not touching water. Um, and this is also a reason why they're a particular risk for pollution and oil spills. So they survive in cold water because of this fur. Um, without it, or if there's injury, damage, or anything like that, they can quickly become hypothermic, right? So this video i just like to play out because it's a really good visual to give you all of a sense this is an infrared video clip of a sea otter um 
how much heat they lose in the cold water and also how hot they run. So you can see the heat trail as it's swimming around in the areas. And you can also, if you're looking at its eyes, the mouth, the nostril, the paws, how bright that is. So a lot of heat is coming out from those areas. Um, so with the fact that they're running hot, they have one of the highest metabolic rates um, for their size. And so it really makes sure that they can maintain that internal temperature, right? They're endotherms. They have to constantly be stoking fuel and that fire to stay warm in the cold environment. So we are going to be discussing so much more about metabolics and energetics in the second webinar, but I did want to just, that to me gives a really good visual of what they're always dealing with. So now another thing that people don't always consider, but there is a huge dilemma, is to consider salt in the marine environment. And we do forget that salt balance is extremely important. And so this is an issue for marine mammals. And marine mammals, they actually have what we call reniculated kidneys. And so that basically means a kidney with multiple lobes. And each of those lobes has more loops of Henle. And so that allows them to increase the ability to create high, high concentrations of sodium and chloride to excrete. Um, and so what's unique for otters specifically is that those lob uh, lobulated kidneys um, are actually respectively larger with respect to their body mass than other marine mammals. So for their size, they have extremely large kidneys. And so because of that, and the fact that they can excrete such a high quantity of sodium and chloride, they do have the ability to actively consume water and gain free water from their environment. So that's just something a lot of people don't know about, but it is a really interesting adaptation for sea otters. And now we're going to move on a little bit into reproduction and I kind of broke it down to sort of female versus male. Um, but females generally are smaller. So they are the 35 to 60 pound range. Um, they live anywhere from 15 to 20 years. Um, and females have so much to deal with, but um, the metabolic cost actually doubles during their reproduction. Um, and so we're, again, we're going to talk a lot more about that in the second webinar, but it's just something to keep in mind that female sea otters have a lot of costs. Um, they are capable of having a pup per year and it can be in any season. Granted, um, that can definitely be a case of when was her last pup? Was it successful? Did a male find her? Is she an estrus? All of that. Um, but she is physically capable of having a pup per year in any season. And then generally that ends up being six months for gestation. So it's about two months of a delayed implantation and then four months of actual active pregnancy. And then for males, um, in comparison, they are larger. So they can get up to 90 pounds. And to give you sort of perspective, the northern sea otter males can actually get up to 100 pounds. So southern sea otters are the smallest of the subspecies. Um, and male sea otters kind of, I guess, kind of like humans as well. <laughs> they don't live as long as the females. They tend to not live past a 15 year lifespan. Um, and then there's different sort of trade-offs to um, social groups they can be in, right? You can either have a bachelor male or be a territorial male. Um, the bachelor males tend to be younger. They aren't yet able to hold territories. Otherwise they also maybe had a territory and lost it. Um, but these can be sort of sneaker males. They raft together and they can learn a lot. So you see these rafts of males, especially um, there was a raft up in uh, Moss Landing near Jetty Road for a long, long time. Um, hopefully they return, they've disbanded for a bit, but um, you see a lot of interesting behavior there, right? They learn a lot from each other. There's a lot of practicing. Um, territorial males um, have a much more grueling job of holding their territory that's a couple kilometers, right? And they have to content, constantly patrol and check out their females and make sure everything's okay. And so that can be quite taxing. So those are just two different um, trade-offs that you could have as a male. Um, and then for copulation, males do hold females' noses generally during copulation. And it depends on the male. Sometimes this can be quite violent um, and sometimes it doesn't have to be. So I've seen both. Um, and then generally, because it's so difficult, you can imagine trying to, <laughs> to mate in water with something that doesn't want to mate with you, it's going to get really hard to hold on. So that why the nose is sort of the area that they are able to do that. And then they also have a baculum, which is a penal bone. Um, and that also assists them in copulation in water. And then there's a couple facts that have kind of been put out there that males only have black noses, um, that you can ID males because of black noses. Um, males hold pups hostage and they also molest harbor seals. So we're going to touch on each of these as well. So 
talking about no scars. Um, the fact that people kind of assume that any no scar is a female isn't necessarily wrong, right? There's a bit of truth to that. So many females do receive no scarring during copulation. Um, there are definitely a few that don't have the same violent experiences and so scarring is minimal. I have seen females with beautiful black noses before, um, but there are some male sea otters that also receive scarring and that can be due to, to, to territorial disputes. And also, as I was mentioning with the male groups that they're learning a lot, they can also be in a mock copulation, right? So if they're learning to hold on to each other and they're practicing on each other, which isn't uncommon, there's likelihood that you could end up having the scarring that way too. So this otter is Otto. He was a territorial male down in Morro Bay and you can see he actually had a very distinct nose scar. We don't necessarily know how he received that, but it is something that, you know, if you're going to look at him and you can't see his downside, you know, his bottom, you, someone might walk by and assume it's a female and that would be incorrect. So we generally like to say, if you need to sex an animal, if you're going to be reporting this in some sort of data sheet, um, you can't sex them by their nose scar. You need to see the baculum or lack thereof. Um, generally, though, I will say it is true. If you look at a certain individual and the nose scar is super intense and it almost looks like she it no longer has a nose, you can say that I would have a hunch that that's going to be a female, but I would never mark that down in any sort of data that that's a female without confirming that it is not a male. So again, a little bit of fact to that, that yes, that no scars with females, but males also receive scarring too. The next one, pup stealing. So <laughs> definitely got the question, do male sea otters hold pups hostage for food and copulation? And so this term is actually called a uh, hostage behavior and it, it's rare. It has been observed. Um, it was actually recorded by Reedman and Estes in the nineties. And um, it's when a male, they described it as a male seizing the pup when the female is diving for food. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, if you see a pup at the surface, you can only assume that the mom is down there somewhere finding something delicious. And so it makes sense that if you're going to take the food from her, I guess you could just hold the pup. And when she pops up, she's going to drop her food and go for the pup and he'll get the food. Um, so this has been seen. Um, this actually in that paper as well, they even marked that females have been seen doing this to each other as well. So it's not just males. Um, and then there's similar observations that have been made regarding copulation, but less clear like that, more or less, you're generally going to see some sniffing of a pup, picking and moving the pup, pushing the pup away, keeping the pup away from mom, that type of thing. So more of a harassment. <laughs> um, but I do want to point out that these observations are not everyday behavior, right? It's important to distinguish that, you know, we have different individuals and they learn different behaviors and that not every single male or every single sea otter is going to exhibit this behavior, but it is definitely a technique. If you're going to steal something, it definitely works. But I have personally actually never seen hostage behavior happen. Um, so it's something that can happen. So if, can it happen? Yes. Does it happen? Do all sea otters do this? Unlikely. It's most likely learned by certain individuals as a technique that they use. So, and this one's getting a little darker, <laughs> um, but this is definitely a question you see and people like to, to reach on to this one. Um, so let's talk a little bit about interspecies copulation. So the question is, do male sea otters rape baby harbor seals? Um, and so there actually have been 19 occurrences. There's a paper out by Heather Harris from 2010 that kind of went through these instances, but there were 19 occurrences of this interspecies sort of sexual behavior between the male sea otters and, and harbor seals. And it was reported only out of Monterey Bay. Um, and it was between 2000 and 2002. And they do believe there was at least three different male sea otters that were observed and they were harassing, dragging, and attempting to copulate with harbor seals. And some of them even for seven days post-mortem, which is a little rough. So <laughs> they ended up actually recovering 15 of the, the juvenile harbor seal carcasses and seven of those were necropsied. And so they ended up trying, they compared the findings that they had from those 15, uh, the seven that were necropsied and comparing that with some of the necropsied female sea otters that had um, been recovered from male sea otters exhibiting similar behavior to them um, to compare sort of the lesions and, and damage. And so what they did sort of come to conclusion is that yes, um, a lot of the lesions were probably due to the baculum during attempted copulation. Um, so it can be very violent and it can cause damage. Um, 
So yes, certain individuals um, saw an opportunity and proceeded to complete these particular behaviors, but it's incredibly rare. So it has been documented. It was a very short period of time. Um, there has not been any um, documentation since. However, it doesn't mean it can't happen. So it doesn't mean someone else hasn't seen it. It is possible. But as I said, it is very, very rare. Um, and actually one of the males that was captured and removed from the wild population actually proceeded to become one of the otters <laughs> trained in some of the metabolic studies. So they actually, you know, that sea otter particularly was very useful in some of the um, trainings and studies and in future, but was no longer in the population. So perhaps there's also an aspect of others learning from him will no longer happen. Um, but is it something that all sea otters do? No. Is it something that you're going to see everywhere with all male sea otters? No. But yes, it was a very rare, unusual male behavior that was observed. So now let's get to something a little bit happier. <laughs> We're gonna talk a little bit about reproduction and pups. This is a big subject matter. I know that um, a lot of questions from people come specifically about pups. Um, and so they are born at any time of year. And though you can imagine it definitely, again, depends on female success of the last pup, you know, estrus, male finds her, all of that type of stuff. Um, but pups are completely reliant on their mothers at birth. If you look at them when they're first born, it's almost, I mean, I feel like one of the best descriptions I've heard is they look like a beanie baby and it's true. They're like super floppy. Um, they really can't do a whole lot. They completely rely on mom. And so they are on average with their mom for about six months. And so they nurse for about two to three months on milk and the milk that sea otters have is extremely fatty. This is another reason why sea otter moms are energetically um, at risk is because 20 to 25% fat content in their milk. Um, so they're getting lots of good milk from mom for about two to three months. And then mom's going to begin to offer them small bits of pre-cracked food. So she'll start cracking things for them and then letting them sort of taste it after three weeks. And it really isn't until about the six to eight week mark that they actually begin to practice sort of working on bits of solid food themselves. Um, now, twins are possible but are extremely rare. And again, you just have to remember that female sea otters can ultimately only care for one. She is energetically constrained. So she physically would not be able to have enough milk and, and time and, you know, to take care of two. So unfortunately there would only be one that would survive, but again, they are very rare. The natal fur that sea otters have, are born with is extremely dense. Um, they actually kind of, I always call them like little baby Einsteins. They look so fluffy. Um, and because of that, because of that natal fur and mom blowing warm air into them as she grooms them so diligently, they are incredibly buoyant. And so you notice that when she plops them down, they're just floating there like a cork, right? But this also means that they, it takes them a little bit longer to learn how to dive because they're so buoyant and there's so much air in their fur, their fur will not let them go underneath the water. And sometimes you can even watch pups and you can see them attempt to try and they try to put their head under, but their butt won't get under. So they're sort of splashing at the surface. Um, so they really cannot successfully start to get under for at least five seconds to be considered like a dive that they completely submerged until about eight to eight and a half weeks on average. Um, and that's about the time their, their coat is starting to shed and, and acquire the adult coat. Um, but this actually kind of brought into some interest, I was looking through some stuff and brought into question that some people believe that sea otters are forced to learn to dive. And so we're now gonna touch on that fact versus fiction, forced diving. So do sea otters drag pups underwater to teach them to dive? And I guess, I, it's more, I want to say again, pups are really constrained by their pup coat, right? So unless, until they are less buoyant and when they finally start to get that adult coat, getting under is practically impossible. You can see them try and they constantly do. And mom, if you think about it, I mean, she doesn't have a whole lot of time. She's really busy. She's starving. So she's constantly going down, picking up stuff and she'll be very, she'll be attentive to the pup at the surface, but generally there reaches a point where the pup's curiosity and wanting to be with mom overcomes. And you can watch them as they attempt to dive and follow her until they finally reach that age where their coat begins to change, right? So what I would say is that most people, if they've seen something like this, where they say, oh, she dragged the pup under, she's teaching it to dive. I would say it's more likely that that female was startled. 
So a female may grab her pup and pull it under the water. Remember, you know, mammals do have the breath hold response. So if it, even if it was a young one, it would just automatically hold its breath and force it under. It's most likely that she's thinking she's escaping from a perceived threat. Um, so I would not say that this is a, a, a learning to dive, a, a foraging dive. This would be more of a sign of distress. Um, now that could mean that you're that pup learned that whatever that was, was very scary. <laughs> but I think generally they start to learn to dive on their own just because they want to follow mom. And so we haven't necessarily seen forced dives to teach them how to forage. Um, if you see something like that, it's much more that you've probably caused a disturbance or you're seeing her disturbed from something else. All right. So now, hopefully this doesn't come as a surprise, but sea otters are highly associated with kelp and they can be also highly associated with eelgrass. It's fairly dependent on their habitat, but they can use either to anchor themselves so they don't float away. And you can actually see in this little video that he used his teeth and he wrapped himself up um, in that macrocystis. And, but what's interesting is that from this concept of sea otters needing to wrap themselves up, because if they fall asleep, depending on where they are, they can just float away. So that anchoring of the kelp or the eelgrass is really, really important for them and helps them feel secure. But there have been some other things that have come up regarding security and anchoring and, and floating away. So one of them, and maybe everyone already knows this one, but sea otters hold hands so they don't float away. <laughs> and the other one is sea otter wrap their pups in kelp. So let's talk about those two. So hand-holding, this is my hand-holding slide. <laughs> and it is a common misconception for general public that sea otters hold hands so they don't float away. And it really happened because it exploded through social media. It's now an art, cartoons. I even found it in sort of an artsy um, fact book. And when you turn to sea otters, it's the only fact on the entire thing about sea otters is that they hold hands. Um, but the reality is it's not, it's not a common behavior. So I like to, change that question to can sea otters hold hands? Yes, sea otters can hold hands. It has been documented a few times in aquariums. That's where that first sort of photo came out and then that went viral. Um, and there are a few occurrences in the wild. I have seen, you know, some photographers have actually sent these two holding hands was in Foro Bay and it was the first time I didn't, wasn't there to see it, but this is a photo of a colleague, Jenna. And so she took this photo and for her, it was like the first time ever seeing two wild sea otters hold hands. It was shocking. Um, but this is not a daily occurrence. And again, it's, it's most likely a learned behavior for a few individuals um, that makes them feel comfortable um, rather than what I would consider a true sea otter fact. Like, wrapping in kelp to remain anchored. And if it was to be considered a true fact for sea otter behavior, we would see it every time. I would go out there and we would look at a raft and you would have 20 otters holding hands. But the truth is they'd all be together, but they'd be floating away somewhere else. So um, that's why sea otters can hold hands. Do they hold hands so they don't float away? No, they use kelp. They wrap themselves up in kelp to anchor themselves. So again, a little bit of truth to that that maybe got sort of changed over time um, into something completely different. So this one isn't a huge distinction, but I do think it's, it's good to clarify now, right? Because we don't want it to kind of turn into something bigger than it is. Um, but some people have said that sea otters wrap their pups in kelp. Um, so again, it's possible. But generally, if a mom's resting, she's generally going to hold that pup on her stomach or she puts them in a chokehold and kind of teed off. So this is a perfect tea moment. You can see the pup sort of teeing off from mom. And then if she's grooming or she wants to dive nearby, generally moms will just set their pups in kelp. So they just set them at the surface, maybe right on top of the kelp, and she'll start grooming and she'll start diving. Um, but she's not actively wrapping them in kelp like a burrito. And so I try to say, well, if, could you imagine watching a female sea otter take a struggling pup and wrap it and swaddle it in kelp with pot. I mean, it just, the whole thing sort of seems like it'd be really difficult. <laughs> I think generally what people end up seeing is that you might see if she's plopped a pup in kelp, if it's just getting to be an older pup, they might attempt to start playing with the kelp. You can watch them chew on kelp and they might even copy the behaviors. Maybe they kind of want to move around. They're going to try to roll around and they might naturally wrap themselves. Um, but it's not necessarily the mother wrapping them in kelp. Okay. All right, so let's keep going on to some behavior. So um, now there are so many different behaviors, but I think what I wanted to touch on here was that it's particularly unique for sea otters is how they spend their day doing them. So 
I generally like to tell people a good way to think about sea otter's day is that it's going to, it's going to groom, it's going to eat, it's going to groom again, it's going to sleep and then it repeats, right? So it's going to groom before it eats. It's going to groom before it sleeps. It's going to match everything with grooming in between all of these activities. Keep that coat and keep that warmth. Um, and of course there's going to be miscellaneous interactions, copulations, and a few other behaviors mixed in. But when we look at sort of the 2019 data from out of Monterey Aquarium, um, sea otters are feeding on average 30, over 30% 30 a day. And then they're also resting over 38, you know, resting, that's insane. <laughs> it's sort of amazing to imagine that you can rest that much and feed that much. And that is a lot of food. So you can imagine they're really tired and they're really hungry. And again, this comes back to the fact that they have that high metabolic rate and they're living in a cold environment. And again, these are just averages that are specific to Monterey, but really depending on the location you have them in, the individual, they can be eating, foraging up to 50% of their 24 hour period of day, okay? So sea otters have many different activities, but they really spend a lot of time just doing a couple, a few. So this brings me now to if they are so voracious, <laughs> and they do eat so much. So what are they eating? And so sea otter prey is a variety of invertebrates um, and they generally forage close to shore and shallower depths. So they tend to not go deeper than 60 feet, but the deepest dive was actually a male at 264. So it's not that they aren't capable, but generally what they will be searching for is going to be in shallower depths. Um, and their average time is approximately a minute. Though again, the longest dive or the breath hold was a male at 7.9 minutes. And so this kind of goes into what you're choosing to eat really influences where you're going to go and how long you're going to be down there, right? So if you're shallower, you potentially could stay longer and dig deeper for something, or perhaps if you want something that's really great, but it's really deep. So there's different trade-offs, right, to the energy that you're going to have to put in for finding your food. Um, the other thing to note is that sea otters are 24 hour foragers, meaning they will forage day or night and they are not constrained by daylight. So touch with their paws and whiskers is really the critical sense for them when they're foraging. And they end up consuming approximately, this is probably the one that everyone knows, a quarter of their body weight each day. And it's really to help, again, back to that metabolism, to keep them stoked, to keep them warm, to keep them going, okay? And so there are five prey specialist foraging types that are distinguished in California. Um, there's the crab, abalone, mussel, sea snail, and clam. And so what this means is that an individual will specialize in a group and becomes the master of it, okay? So this doesn't mean that they cannot happen upon or eat something else, um, but it basically means the majority of their prey consumed will fall under one of those foraging types. And the specialization allows them to become experts, right? Because time is of the essence, time is money. So it becomes, it allows them to become incredibly efficient with their foraging. And then of course, efficiency to add to that too is tool use, right? So sea otters are known to use tools um, and they are generally used with the snails, clams and mussel eaters. Um, and that kind of brought up the next interesting fact versus fiction. Um, that people have an idea that sea otters have a favorite rock for life. And so do sea otters have a favorite rock for life? Well, I guess I want everyone to sit here and think and consider, first of all, what would be the reasoning and, and would a sea otter realistically carry a rock all day, every day? Um, and then how would you study this? So if you think about it, it would be really difficult to truly know because you would have to mark every single rock in some sort of different way. So you would be able to watch them and use that rock. Um, and then it's just, if you look at the one on the left, that's a large rock. I'm trying to put that in its pocket. It might be a little heavy. Um, so we do know that sea otters can use rocks as tools and that the type and frequency of the tool they use really can vary across the populations. Um, and it's possible there, that there could be preference to shape and size. So maybe every time they go down, I like a really flat rock or I like a really round rock. Um, that can be documented, but then um, the fact that they also will put small ones into their pocket and dive down when they're in a foraging bout 
but there's no indication that they actually keep that rock or that tool that they're using after they're done with that bout, right? So if they're done eating, they tend to leave it down there. It doesn't mean they couldn't necessarily go back to something that's similar, um, but they're, it would be really heavy and energetically costly for them to be carrying rocks in their little armpit pockets. Um, so that's something to consider when people ask about that is get them to try to think about, well, what's the cost of that? You know, is that feasible for them? Is that likely that they would do that? Um, so that's kind of how I like to approach that question. And so then since we were talking about how voracious they are and such good eaters and how efficient, um, this ends up having a big ecological implication, right? So if they are eating that many invertebrates, um, that has an impact. And so that actually sea otters are considered a keystone species. And that means that they in particular have a large scale community effect that's disproportionate to their abundance. Okay. So in the term really stems from architecture. So a keystone, and this is kind of how I like to describe this to people because it's really easy for them to kind of visualize an arch. Um, but that keystone is that center stone and it's putting pressure on the supporting stones that are putting pressure back upwards to create the arch, right? So if everything's in balance, you have an arch. But when that keystone is removed, the remaining stones fall. And that ends up being an analogy for that ecological community. It's being altered. Interactions can disappear, they can change. Um, and it's really because they consume such, such larger quantities of these marine invertebrates, um, they keep the nearshore marine ecosystem in balance, right? So it's enhancing kelp forests and seagrass beds. And these provide the direct and indirect effects that like habitat, um, biodiversity, reduction in coastal erosion, carbon storage, et cetera. So they are truly ecosystem superheroes. Um, and that's something that I think is to use that for the public, it, they are, gets them to understand that their neighbors, their local sea otters are actually benefiting them. Okay, and so now I'm actually, I'm gonna end this webinar today by touching on their status. So the Southern Sea Otter was listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act in 1977. And it was truly due to the fact of the reduced range, the population size, and the fact that they are so vulnerable to oil spills and coastal tanker traffic, okay? So they are at risk because remember that unique physiology, they rely on their coat to stay warm for their insulation. Um, and there's many other vulnerabilities as well. White shark predation has increased and we're again, we're going to talk about that in week uh, three. And of course, there's infectious diseases, parasites, boat strikes, fishing gear, entanglements and toxins. So there's all these different puzzle pieces that kind of come together for what's happening to reduce range and population size um, and keeping it there. But um, certain locations um, around Long California now have actually increased numbers. So some of these areas are actually at carrying capacity or expected at carrying capacity for sea otters. And that means that they now have prey limitation. So basically those areas are at the, the max amount of otters that they can naturally support for that ecosystem. And so it begins to question at looking at, okay, well, why isn't the range expanding at the ends? What's happening? Um, and that is a really big discussion that I want to put in your guys' heads, but we're going to save it for the nice juicy last webinar because it is complex and it goes much more in depth. But it kind of, all of this, the status and talking about what's happening with range expansion is all part of this. Um, and so ultimately, right now, numbers are holding around that 3000 mark and they're being relatively steady. And that's why the status is under review. But regardless, sea otters are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Okay, and it protects all marine mammals in US waters. And so with the 1994 amendments, they actually included that to, um, to include protection against harassment and disturbance, which is where I'm gonna end this today because I wanna pick up next week discussing more about human sea otter interactions, um, what is disturbance and how really get more into the sea otter physiology and what 